And I like that Chuck Langley talks about speciation. I'm not telling you what he told me 30 years ago. So Chuck is a professor of population genetics at UC Davis. Right. Yeah, so I um, received this um, assignment, which is, uh, is, is ironic in the sense that I, uh, while I've had uh, a number of postdocs in my lab who have worked diligently, and I'll talk about some of their work on speciation, I, I, you won't find my fingerprints on speciation except for the work I did as an undergraduate. Uh, yeah, but but I, I, I am a student of speciation and, uh, and uh, interested in it. And actually, this assignment has changed my attitude about not so much about speciation, but the context of speciation in a more positive way, as you'll see, well, probably after lunch. Anyway, so um, it's sort of um, hard to know exactly what to uh, present to, in this setting of this, uh, of this uh, program, but uh, I've decided to take a pretty simple, straightforward approach, uh, make sure that everybody's sort of on a little bit on the same page and there's some basic things, and then uh, devote maybe a, a latter half to sort of a more uh, recent, exciting things. So the beginning of, or this is, I put this up just to, to start because this is going to be an essential part of the, of the idea. This is a quote from uh, Meyer, but actually probably more championed by Deb Shiansky. And uh, let me see my poor computers here. Oh, <laughs> the UBSB got pulled out. Well, there we go. So, uh, and I have one more disclaimer. Uh, right in about 10 minutes or 15 minutes, you could go over to uh, uh, BLSB and see uh, Michael Torelli speak. I don't think he's going to talk about speciation. He's probably talking about his recent work on Wolbachia. But he's one of the greatest living students of speciation and contributed much to both theoretical and many of the interesting meta-analyses. And he also, just to make sure I didn't get too far off the path, and since he had in recent last few years delivered lectures on speciation to groups not unlike this one, he shared with me some of his notes. Uh, some of it was useful, some of it was uh, arcane, and so I, but I want to admit that I've plagiarized, or worse than plagiarized, yeah, plagiarized is, uh, his stuff, uh, some of his stuff. Okay, so this is the basic topics that I want to cover. I'll discuss this basic concept and the context. It's very much related to the ideas that Monty introduced yesterday from the history of the neo-Darwinian synthesis. And then uh, really, in some sense, reversing directions a little bit, but to get into the biogeography of speciation, which predated, uh, well, Darwin was uh, a uh, practitioner and many others had ideas about how diversity arose related to biogeography. We'll deal a little bit with time scale and I'll show you some of the crude tools that uh, much progress has been made with them, but I think we can expect a much better, more accurate view of the process that we'll describe, we'll look at in the coming uh, decade as, as uh, much of the ancient gene, simple gene-based data is replaced with genomic data. And of course, fundamental to, to the concept of, of uh, reproductive isolation is, of course, the genetic basis of post, you'll, uh, we'll deal with post-zygotic isolation, which have to do with uh, genetic incompatibilities. Uh, I will spend some time, and this is sort of my rheostat on the whole discussion. This would bridge over into lunch. There's a, there's a wealth of recent genetic analysis of actual cases, individual cases, uh, and believe it or not, there have not, there are only a handful still, that are quite interesting and illuminating. And, and I think it's important with respect to what I want to say at the end for me to dwell on it just for you to get some sense of how hard these people have worked for a decade and a half to just get one gene. And, you know, seven students and three postdocs and three NIH grants and one gene. So it's, it's a lot of work, and, and I think we're ready uh, both after that experience and also technologically to start to 
to consider a more uh, genome-wide and higher throughput approach. Um, how to meld that with the biology that underlies this uh, will be a challenge, of course. Okay, so let's start here with, uh, with the basic idea. So Darwin and everybody else uh, who thought about this seriously in the last century realized that, and the systematists before that, Linnaeus and other, realized that organisms tended to be uh, clustered uh, individually into groups which were species, and then as, the, as genetics started to imbue the concepts of organismic biology and Darwin introduced the concept of actual processes going on in populations, it was quite natural to uh, develop an idea about uh, a species that was based on separate lineages and that they, they are distinct lineages. And in order for them to be distinct, there has to be some mechanism which prevents, uh, uh, um, makes them reproductively isolated. So populations of organisms that have become, in some sense, reproductively separated. Now, before I get into the details, a little bit more detail about this, let me just point out two really important aspects of, of speciation and, and this whole topic. One is, of course, that if you do biology, it's critical that you actually have what you think you have. And actually, uh, geneticists, population geneticists, are much closer to, say, computer scientists when it comes to actually figuring out what material to use and so forth. There are people who, a small number, usually one or two for each group of organisms, who have really devoted a large part of their life to keeping track of what's out there and what, what's there. And so there are practical reasons to cluster things even if you don't have the, the detailed genetics or whatever to actually be sure about every, every case. And so when you start to do biology, you need somebody to tell you what species you're working with. And so it has enormous practical uh, applications independent of these more high-level concepts. Historically and still today, uh, when there's ambiguity today and historically, uh, uh, what's a separate species is a matter of authority uh, very often, in at least the way it appears in the literature. I mean, for example, if you, if you have data that shows that two populations are, not, are reproductively um, uh, not isolated, you could write a paper where you say, I think these are different species, but if you don't go through the formalism of systematics to declare these now new species, the journals and the whole journal biological editorial process will sort of cough and resist you. So there's a whole process of, of, uh, that has to do with the, the formalism of naming, and most of us don't have time for this at all. So we rely on people who actually have chosen that as their occupation. And so there's this delicate relationship between the practical and the authority that one has to keep in, tr in mind. So I raise this only if you find yourself in, in these days more and more in genomics. People are working on new organisms that haven't been studied very well before. And it's a common experience of evolutionary biologists to be handed a group of organisms and start doing some analysis and discover, oh yeah, these two are not really different species. Or this one is actually two different species. It comes out of the genetics pretty quick, population genetics pretty quickly. So dealing with these practical things is, is sort of a part of the, of, of the process. Okay, so the, the basic idea that came out of the neo -Dar or emerged during the neo-Darwinian uh, synthesis in the, like in the, in the 40s, 30s and 40s, Dar and Dubchansky, as I said, was a champion and Meyer also, was to say, let's don't depend on authority, let's don't depend on morphology, let's have an operational not only an operational uh, uh, definition in terms of, of, of actual genetic, maybe you can do genetic analysis to see if they're reproductively <laughs> isolated, two populations, but more importantly, that the reproductive isolation is the necessary and sufficient uh, uh, condition for, it was assumed and it seems to be true, it's holding up, is that if two populations are reproductively isolated long enough, they will diverge uh, and, and never come back together. Now, modern gene te technology can probably overcome everything, but 
in the real world, it's, uh, ha that's the way it happens. Now, one of the things that's when I teach introductory evolution and so forth, I always make an enormous apology. As we just heard, most of life on Earth, most life today by biomass, most everything about life is in fact uh, largely prokaryotic and certainly microbial. Uh, and so this definition here, because of the, the reproductive um, <clears throat> life history of microbes, the, this, this is a much too stringent requirement uh, to define uh, <coughs> a species for microbes because the assumption of being reproductively isolated to groups is that they actually, there's some kind of uh, necessary reproductive interaction of individuals. So outbreeding uh, multicellular organisms, you, um, eukaryotes, they of course can fit fine into that if they're obligate outbreeders or fairly common outbreeders. But for example, some of you I know have wrestled with the, the population genetics, genomics of say just simple yeast isolates or other fungi. It's quite complicated to think about what the individual is and with respect to our models that we've been discussing or will discuss, where is the individual, where, how often do they actually reproduce in what way. <clears throat> so this concept becomes, fails. And I think it's generally accepted that, uh, that uh, the microbial world relies much more on, on, on uh, these two necessary conditions for dealing with what is, in fact, I mean, there is coherence to lots of microbial organisms in nature, <coughs> but the coherence is not based on this. And there could be lots of small side shoots wandering off in different directions. We would be hard pressed to know that. OK, so the final thing is, by way of introduction, I just want to warn you, if you, if you end up spending decades in biology, you will live long enough to have to sit through a one or more uh, uh, occasions where somebody's insisting on having a better idea about what a species concept is than the biological species concept. And, and I hope that happens someday, but uh, you know, most of the time these things serve some secondary, um, say, ecological or maybe some particular group of organisms in some practical way, but actually don't carry over to evolution very well at all. Um, so, I wanted to say one more thing before I get started. I, I'd be, I would have a much better time, and you would have a much better time if, if I, if I say anything you don't understand. And I'm, I, I really don't have a good gauge of your, the biology here. So, I, I'm probably, uh, if there's things that people want to talk about, some of these things, please do. Okay. So, here's the basic thing now. To, I've given you sort of where I'm going to go. Uh, much of what's happened in the last 15 or 20 years is very careful re-examination of the patterns of isolation that occur in nature among different groups, especially sister taxa or closely related species of animals and plants. And the, the great, as you will see, the great majority of those give a very clear uh, story that uh, was noted by uh, early Investigators uh, Jordan and even uh, even Darwin, to some extent, noted that closely related organisms very often are found not superimposed geographically, but isolated, separated. Um, and the other one of the difficult problems with trying to determine in natural environments what's uh, whether things are reproductively isolated to different, is that there are a multitude of ecological and behavioral sources of, of potential sources of, bear, of, uh, of uh, uh, isolation that one has to always be uh, uh, aware of. Okay, so those are sort of caveats. So the basic sort of bread and butter of speciation biology <coughs> is first, besides the biological species concept, is to divide the isolation mechanisms uh, into pre- and post-zygotic. So already we're thinking about diploids, and as I said, that for this 
this idea to go down the road in any effective way, we, you basically need it to be a sort of almost outbreeding population. And so then when there, there's mating, uh, there can be isolation that occurs before mating or after mating. And sometimes these, some people, uh, for a while there was confusion. I think the literature is pretty much settled now on pre- and post-zygotic, but the, there used to be a, a distinction. Some people were pre- and post-mating. Some people were pre- and post-zygotic. Um, but these days, mostly people talk uh, pre- and post-zygotic. But there can be mechanisms, obviously. These are mating mechanisms and other ecological mechanisms that could prevent, uh, iso create isolation by um, uh, pre-mating isolation. Okay, so... Maybe before you go on, yeah? just Pardon? Example. Maybe before you go on, you just give like, an example. I got, I oh, uh, for example, a lot of a lot of animals uh, basically just don't recognize even close, especially we'll get to in a minute. But for example, uh, in those cases where the close relative actually does live in the same geographic area, it's very common for them to recognize right away that that's not the right species and behaviorally. And then they're all, that would be prezygotic. Postzygotic would be failure to develop or failure for the fertilization to even occur or to develop in what looks like a perfectly normal organism except can't find its way home, right? Or goes into the wrong niche. Or sterile. That oh, sterile is, of course, the most common uh, single phenotype for ones that are viable. So, um, yeah. They don't mate, uh, they, they, these two species don't mate because they don't like to or they cannot produce offspring? Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so here's a really good example, one that's uh, a newer. There's a lot of uh, these are examples. Excuse me, there are examples of ones where uh, a prezygotic isolation uh, is sometimes systematically different among organisms. This is a fairly for a long time we resisted this idea that there might be some uh, sort of biological differences between groups of organisms in the in the whole process, but it's become quite clear. Very elegant work of this kind of meta-analysis of lots of different species pairs that uh, songbirds, uh, by and large, uh, have remarkable amount of uh, tolerance of mating. Uh, if you can get them to mate, they produce viable offspring uh, quite nicely, and they, they do, they're fertile. But the, most of the songbird pairs, their close relatives, they, they very, have very strong pre-mating isolation. And that's presumably involved with the mate choice, mate, you know, the behavioral complex that goes around uh, those organisms uh, may uh, drive that process, just make it much more efficient at uh, recognizing uh, uh, potential problems. And Drosophila is, a counter, is an old, and, and we'll see in the counter or maybe more representative example, uh, the rate at which these things appear, as you'll see in a minute, is pretty much the same, about the same rate. Question. So, what do you mean by allopatric? Oh, so I, I'm, I'm going to get to that in just, I, that shouldn't be there, but anyway. Um, allopatric means geographically distinct. So, just to get ahead of myself, just one slide. Allopatric means two different places in a geographic sense. There could be difference, they could be sympatrically they could be geographically in the same county or even in the same tree, but somehow within the tree separated. And that, that does happen rarely. But allopatry refers to just the range distribution in geography. And so if they're allopatric, they're in different places. Okay. What's intrinsic mean? Yeah, so then I was going to get to that next. So in, there are, you can imagine that there's isolation that arises because of the inherent biology. Usually intrinsic means you, it happens in the lab. Okay, and extrinsic are usually things that are contingent on something in nature. Or not, not only contingent, sometimes it, nature is doing it, period. Right. Okay, now here's, yeah, sorry. Um, so if you have something like a mule, for instance. A mule, yes. That's true. That's true. But the the horses that the horses that produce mules would have fewer horse horse offspring. Yeah. 
because they're making mules, and those mules are not having any progeny. And so those horses are not as fit as the ones that choose to mate with other horses. I see. So, so are mules just because of artificial, you know, I mean, do people, it's because people want mules or? or oh, why, why? Uh, there are many situations in which hybrids actually have certain kinds of vigor. Uh, mules are, are very strong, useful organisms in some settings. They just don't reproduce. But I think what you're trying to happen uh, is that are, do mules occur naturally or are they like a... Uh, I don't think they occur naturally, no. No, they don't occur naturally. As far as I know, they yeah. don't. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. no, they wouldn't. Uh, I, I, yeah, no, no, but if you put a horse and a donkey in a pen for a week or something, <laughs> something will happen. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I don't know the details of the horse donkey. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 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 you see hybrids in nature. That, you, you see hybrid zones. Oh, no, the, the, the mule, in the mule case. Mule we see a lot. We'll get to that in a minute. There are plenty of hybrids in nature. It's just that particular one. I don't know about it being in nature, but there are plenty of hybrids in nature. We'll spend quite a bit of time in the next lecture talking about it. Okay, okay. Okay, so. Um, so there, these are uh, observations that, that I think are probably uh, important in this kind of setting to realize is that, that the, the variation that one sees between closely related species when you measure everything at the morphological, physiological level, uh, it, there's no sort of unique difference that species have that doesn't occur within the species also. <laughs> So the same kind of variation, maybe the magnitude's not always quite as great, but there doesn't seem to be a qualitative uh, difference in, this is quite a, I think, a quite widely accepted and general result. There doesn't seem to be at the level, the macroscopic level, certainly, we'll get to the genomic issues in a minute, but uh, anyway, so that's important. Um, and so the conclusion that most people draw from this is that, that it's not, uh, there's not some special process that's going on, but that speciation is really uh, 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 at least it's uh, it may be sufficient, and it's certainly a good starting position to just assume that natural selection and other processes are going on within a population. If those two populations are separated, the cumulative effects of that will not only be, as we heard, adaptation to local environments, but they will also lead to uh, incompatibilities such that the hybrids are less fit. And that whole process that's associated with the hybrids being less fit is really what we, we want to yeah. concentrate on. And so it's, this is what I was just saying, is it is thought that, the, that in, and especially in allopatry, the divergence that occurs just due to other processes would be enough to lead or could lead to this divergence that is the basis of the incompatibility. And, and um, I'm, um, um, I, I'll mention it in another slide. Uh, you can see it in the slides. I, I, uh, this first part of this talk is not only cribbed from uh, Torelli, but it's basically a synopsis, not a very good one, I would say, of uh, the book that I was showing you on the front page a few years ago, uh, Jerry Coyne and, and Alan Orr wrote a, a sort of definitive book on speciation. And all the references, or anyway, this reference and a number of other references I made it can be found in that book. And uh, this is a famous uh, paper now, some 20 years old, that used the isthmus of, of Panama to study uh, the, and this would be pre-mating isolation, of different kinds of crabs where there's a there was originally one population when the ocean covered the isthmus, and as the ocean got lower and lower, uh, the, I, the crabs species then became separated, and so there are pairs of species on each side of the, of the, of the isthmus. And uh, Knowlton and her colleagues uh, did a simple thing. They had a, this particular crab had a really easy assay for mating acceptance, and so they just took crabs from each side of the isthmus and presented them to the crabs on the other side and made and developed some kind of score for whether they would accept the crabs. And it showed a very nice uh, cumulative effect of time. The crabs that have been separated very recently ha are 
more uh, interested in the crabs from the other side of the isthmus than the ones that have been separated for five million years. And there's a sort of linear relationship between the, the ability, the pre-mating isolation, measures of pre-mating isolation, and, and the time that they've been separated. So that, that's just a, one of the sort of classic cases. There, I'll show you some more in a minute on Drosophila, but that one is very simple to understand, and it has a nice geological dating uh, paired sample uh, kind of a design, which is nice. Sorry, I was going to ask you, is there any conjectured mechanism for how this happens? There, I mean, I mean it, it, it's nice, this correlation between geological time and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. mating isolation. Yeah, so the, the, you get, so how it happens, I guess, I guess what <coughs> we could, uh, the answer is almost no, okay, but everybody's quite comfortable with the idea that there's natural selection going on all the time. And, and as you, if you think about a little bit about hybrid incompatibility, we'll get to it in a minute, that's a, that has to be an intera a negative interaction between genes that have, or, yeah, genes that have evolved on one lineage and genes that have evolved on the other. You bring them together, they have a negative interaction. And, and so the question is, what are those genes that are diverging? You know, in some sense, it's a whole genome, but different rates and so forth. And to what extent are they... How, what are the mechanisms and the frequency of the incompatible interactions? But this, this also has to come with some sort of cognitive evolution that these crabs are cognitively evolving to prefer, um, you know, if the crabs initially were all... No, they prefer, they're just evolving to mate with the ones that are in their neighborhood, right? And over a million years, they get pretty, they keep up with that. And they're all mating very happily. Right. And here comes this strange looking crab from the other side of the isthmus. You know, I'm not that interested. Right, but as these species diverge, then cognitively they also need to diverge in their mating preferences, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, and in fact, most evolutionists think that almost all characters are diverging, maybe in a directional way sometimes, sometimes in a, in a random way. But they don't, they're very, you know, their stasis is there on a growth scale, but a lot of, there's a lot going on under the hood. I mean, after all, you know. The genes are turning over at a pretty hefty rate. Sure, sure, sure. So I've got no problem with randomness. I mean, as a computer yeah. scientist, yeah. randomness is great. Yeah, okay. Um, but, but, but the fact that cognitively their preferences track this random divergence, that, you know, uh, but, our, our ancestors all used to be... But wrong. cognitively, they're probably tracking their population, which is moving in some direction. Okay. And so after a period of time, the, the two populations are di look different. You can look at them. They look sure. different. And they can tell the difference. And over time, they look more and more different. Yeah. I think that, that's what everybody thinks is going on. I don't think it's, you know, I don't think we know anything deep. And this, the crabs are not a model system. Listen, this was like a lot of sunshine and walk, scuba diving. And there wasn't much <laughs> genomics involved. <laughs> It, it could also go the other way. I mean, the, the evolution of the preferences could drive the character development. That'd be like sexual selection, is what that's called. It seems to happen. Sure, sure. I mean, presumably the crabs. Part of the mate choice in the crabs is involved with these characters that they display to each other, and so there's sexual selection going on. You know, in almost all outbreeding organisms, there's strong sexual selection going on, and. That's constantly a competitive, frequency-dependent process. So sometimes p the individuals cue on new characters, so that will drive a new character in, and pretty soon the population's got fancy plumes or has lost them or whatever. So we don't really, but it's generally thought that not only these mating characters, but disease resistance, competition, and environment to the phys adaptation to the physical environment is driving some rate of substitution, and that the genes. All, at this point, we have to consider that all of those genes could be involved in the incompatibility, the divergences in those genes. Okay, so uh, this is, the, I hope I never have to do this again. I guess I will have to do it in the fall uh, when I teach population. So, so unfortunately, because when you're studying speciation, you want lots of different species pairs because the only data point you have is a pair of species that are closely related. And so that means you have to collect data on first the phenotype. For example, if we were looking at crabs, we'd have to look at whether they want to mate or behave hostily towards each other. In the case of Drosophila postzygotic, you would have to make matings and see if the embryos survive. A lot of work goes into the type, the phenotyping and characterization of the biology. And almost all these organisms are 
esoteric, hard to get, and interesting to work with, but they don't have very good genetics or population genetics, haven't in the past. And so, as Monty mentioned yesterday, they, but they are very ripe for the classic sort of allozyme technology. So almost everything we know about the, the rates of divergence at the genetic level uh, with respect to hybridization and uh, speciation and, uh, is uh, based on allozyme data. And so it's a little bit, I, like I said, I hope we don't stay here very much longer because I'm not so worried about the quality of the data, but the number of loci and the resolution of the data. It's very noisy compared to what we can do now. We have the whole genome. We, get, we don't even, we can nail the divergence to you know, several significant digits. So it's a very different world. So, but this is the classic NASE genetic distance. It just measures, this is just the proportion of identity when alleles chosen from two different groups, two different populations compared to uh, the identity uh, when it's, uh, when it, uh, in the in the two alleles chosen from the same population, and with the usual sort of correction for mutation, Poisson nature of mutations, you can get a good approximation. That should be an approximate sign, sorry, uh, uh, for the uh, divergence uh, between the two populations. And so this is a, like a standard tool. Allozymes in this tool can give you some measure of how different two populations are at the genetic level. Uh, in the genome, the genes presumably don't have anything to do with incompatibility, and they're very few. They're usually the same set of 20 to 30 genes uh, chosen because they're convenient. And, but we're going to use this measure to get a handle on uh, the rate and the properties of, of, uh, of uh, incompatibility. And uh, just to sort of get warmed up here a little bit with the vagaries of this, I want to, uh, I'll spend a moment here just uh, going over a little bit of typical data. So this is, this is just some data for subpopulations. So this would be things that everybody agrees are the same species, even the same subspecies. There's no taxonomic dispute whatsoever. They're just different places in the distribution of the organism. And so people, this is data from coin and ore. This is collected at different uh, resolution, or different numbers of populations for all these different species besides humans and mice. This is the horseshoe crab and the Anolis lizard and, and uh, fish and Drosophila. And you can see there's just not very many loci involved in these estimates. And the, the, these are the sort of range of observations for the divergence. Very little divergence actually between most of these animals because they get around pretty well and populations are not very different. If you go to what uh, the authorities refer to as subspecies, and of course a subspecies is sort of like a hot potato in the sense that it, a subspecies could become a species if you did some more work and you showed that it was really reproductively isolated. Or it could just be geographic differentiation and it's not really a thing, it's just two ends of a continuum. And so uh, most, most geneticists and population geneticists really handle subspecies gingerly. They don't usually suspiciously, just like it's just a species, just another population, it might be a little bit different. Shape. But the point is that what, what are recognized at the systematic level as uh, subspecies often do have considerably more uh, divergence between populations than do things that are not subspecies. So after all, the systematists are detecting populations that are differentiated, whether they are reproductively have any reproductive isolation or not is uh, usually uh, the people who do reproductive isolation usually would just ignore this and say, well, okay, there's just some more populations, and then if they were, were reproductively isolated, they declare them a different species. Okay, now here's the critical data, uh, but like I said, I'm not terribly happy with the numbers, but the results seem to hold up, so we feel pretty comfortable about them. So this is a number, of, again, of animal species, and and uh, what we're looking at is sibling, closely related species, usually sister taxa, and asking how diverged are, are they uh, sister taxa that are, in fact, the closest good species. Now, at this point, I'm using my authority to tell you what a good species is, but suffice it to say, most of these would pass the, pass the biological species concept. And so it's roughly the, the to genus, I mean, um, 
NASD is about 0.08, which when calibrated from fossil record for uh, different organisms uh, and differently for some of these, but it's roughly a million years. So I usually keep as a sort of rule of thumb, try to imbue it on other people as I'm not sure if it's, it could be off by an order, by factor of two or so, but roughly for animals, and I think probably for plants it might be a little bit different. We don't really have enough data, I don't think. Uh, it looks like it's about a million years is a sort of most nominal time for, uh, for uh, things to be evolved into what's considered a good species. Okay. Now I want to go back to this question that we discussed a little bit uh, before and just go over this again. So pre-mating and post-mating isolation is thought to, I mean, first of all, uh, isolation is thought to almost all of it, like 80, 90 percent of the cases where you have populations that have evolved biological isolation, reproductive isolation, usually these have occurred in allopatry. And the evidence for that is First of all, as I mentioned in the beginning, a lot of organisms, they, they are found to not co-occur even though they're sister taxa. So they'll be on two different sides of a mountain range or two different sides of a river, and, and they, uh, but they're the closest relatives. And so they're in allopatry, and it's assumed and sometimes demonstrated that they, uh, that they have been that way for quite a while and that the reproductive isolation arose in that, in that situation. That, as we just discussed, the, the actual uh, isolation could arise because of selection for any number of traits, which then could give rise in hybrids to some kind of incompatibility. And as I mentioned, Darwin and Jordan, and, and Jordan was really an early champion of this idea that when you find the closest related species, it's almost always geographically separated. There is controversy about this because there are some wonderful cases of sympatric speciation that have definitely been nailed down. And I didn't want to present it because I find meta-analysis pretty dull, but actually there's a bunch of heavy lifting of meta-analysis of all the, the cases of all the different organisms. And Torelli's been involved a little bit in this. Anyway, it's, it's, it's holding up the, uh, almost all of these contentions about allopatry and so forth have, uh, have withstood uh, fairly, I'd say, complete meta-analysis of available data on a number of different groups of organisms. So now this gets me now to the, to, to the nub of the, of, and the turning point here. I think I, uh, I want to say, just before we leave, is that sympatric speciation um, is people will say maybe one or two percent, maybe five percent of the cases where species arise in sympatry almost always involve some um, uh, some uh, unique property of the ecology and the behavior. For example, the classic one that's often cited is uh, um, an insect that grows on, say, a native, a wild uh, fruit, say, wild cherry. And then the farmers plant a whole bunch of cherry trees in Michigan, and the, the insect, one of the insects or a couple of the insects, for whatever reason, start jump onto the cherry. And since the organisms mate and live on the fruit, the ones that tend to go to this new fruit are have a propensity to stay on that fruit. And so very quickly, you get a second population that's totally geared towards the second the new introduced resource. And so there, there's a strong coupling between mating and resources. In almost all the cases in animals where you see sympatric speciation that's pretty valid, there's almost always a very strong coupling between a mating and resource, uh, ecological resource. The other one that recently has come out is there's these uh, African um, nest parasite birds. They're quite, it's a whole group of them. They're very clever. They basically lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. And the, the, the chicks then grow up hearing the, the song of the new species. And so they, they and then and the males sing it, and pretty soon they just adopt, a, they have a new clay that's now parasitizing this other one, and they learn the song from the other one. And the daughters who grew up in those nests heard the song from their father, and so they just become nest parasites of the next species. 
and they don't interbreed with the ones that were on the other species because they have a different song and so forth. So it happens very quickly, and, and so these organisms have uh, these birds have uh, radiated quite extensively in in uh, very rapidly and often sympatrically. Can you give a, 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 just a simple definition of sympatric? Yeah, it's overlapping geographic distribution. Okay, sorry. What, what, what about time? For sympatric? Yeah, I mean, if you have, for example, <clears throat> a mating difference in, in time bonds. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah we're, we get to the, the Drosophila data where that's solid. Okay. Anyway, so we want to know something more about this process. And, but before we do that, I want to, I want to <coughs> mention the more complicated cases besides sympatry and allopatry, uh, which are quite interesting. And one of the things that happens uh, more than we ever wanted to know, but now we, we know as data becomes better, data on more organisms <laughs> become clear, and we listen to our geologists more carefully, we realize that, uh, that there's a lot of potential secondary contact. So what happens is in organisms are physically in allopatry, they, di they diverge, but sometimes they come back together uh, and have secondary contact, it's called. And the populations uh, start to interact and they form hybrids. And a hybrid zone can form at these boundaries where they come back together. And, and for example, you can have a whole summer of tourism in Europe studying hybrid zones that have to do with the glaciation moving back and forth, everything from bears to grasshoppers and all kinds of plants. There are hybrid zones in almost all the Alpine and Pyrenees paths. You just walk over the path. And there's one species here, one there, and there's a hybrid zone in the mountain pass. And these are all secondary contacts. And, and when you have a secondary contact, there, there basically are uh, there's sort of two scenarios or three, depending on whether you want, how finely you want to divide it up. Obviously, if they've evolved pre-mating isolation already, then they're going to just become good species because there won't be any way for them. They'll be isolated permanently. So if they don't recognize each other and don't mate in the field, they'll be separate. On the other hand, if they do mate and they, but they're sterile or inviable, uh, they'll be good species. But of course, both sexes and both sexes have to be sterile and or inviable. If one sex is, happens to be viable and fertile, then there can be back crossing with the other species and genes could flow between the two populations. So these are what leads to good species. And then there, there's an interesting uh, um, alternative is, let's suppose that the hybrids are fertile and, and viable, obviously. The thing could just fuse back into one species how long it would take, it would obviously set up a hybrid zone depending on how much differentiation there's been, but they would, uh, the, in principle, on some time scale having to do with the rate of migration and so forth, the populations could just fuse back into one big population. On the other hand, if the hybrids are less fit than either parent, especially in the hybrid zone, then uh, what you will get is a hybrid zone forming where uh, where in hybrids are being formed and genes may be flowing slowly depending on their phenotypic effect. And this is a very interesting and, uh, and I think now uh, wide open area with modern genomics to try to identify uh, what genes are moving across these hybrid barriers. Which ones are moving fast across? Which ones are being inhibited? And do they interact? It's a really sort of natural experiment that doesn't need a lot of resources because you really have two endpoints that are pretty well defined and a fairly narrow object to study. So uh, this is in, I just did a little scan last night in the literature. It's just everybody who can get, you know, $20,000 together and buy some time on a, on a little moon machine is trying to do some study of a hybrid zone or a Klein or some species pair. So literature sort of, and people are no, I'll talk about the analysis in a little in a minute. Okay, so that that's that's important. So so this leads to the the most interesting from my my experience in in studying. And when, and when I was a graduate student, this was a good topic if you wanted to you know, if you were an evolutionist to study was try to find ways to find evidence in this situation that 
pre-mating isolation actually evolves in response to uh, a hybrid zone or a hybrid interaction, hybrid swarm, if they just come together as one population, in which the hybrids are less fit than any gene that uh, makes an individual not mate with its with the other species will have a higher fitness because more of its progeny will be more fit. And so that leads to what's called reinforcement. And we can see now, uh, if we look, oh, yeah, uh, we'll see in a minute uh, what the impact of that is. Trying to find evidence for reinforcement has is, is, uh, been a, a major task for many, many, for two generations, although it's pretty solidly down now. One, another situation that is that besides sympatry which I already discussed is this parapatry this is a this is not in living in California this parapatry is uh, quite relevant because we have this sort of ring of mountains and we have river systems and so whenever you have organisms separated in a sort of linear way for example is one a good example then you can have populations that are next to each other and sometimes the, uh, the environments could be different enough that they actually, uh, local adaptation leads to quite distinct populations. And, and so that can lead then to the same kind of, of uh, selective zone where genes, different genes are moving across the hybrid zone differently, but the hybrid zone arose not from secondary contact, but from some kind of true sort of environmental climb reflecting different environments. Uh, almost all of these are always tortured by the well, you know, uh, 100,000 years ago, those were actually two different populations completely separated, and it's really secondary contact. I think I covered the, that pretty well. Okay, so oh, how much time? Should I quit? The first lecture is over. Okay. <laughs> well, I, so what I, I was, I'm almost there. I was just going to go to the time thing, the, the, D versus, but uh, whatever you want. I think everybody wants to take a break. I can do it next. I'll do it after lunch. Okay. So after lunch, we'll spend a little bit of time on the evidence for the rate at which these things occur and the difference between sympatry and, and allopatry. And then I want to turn to the genes and the genomics of hybrid zones and hybrid uh, and gene flow across hybrid zones. Thank you. Yeah.